when we looked at advanced cancer as an endpoint, metastatic or fatal cancer in the overall follow-up period, we did see a statistically significant 17% reduction in advanced cancer. Now, there are some other randomized trials that also suggest that vitamin D doesn't prevent first um, diagnosis of cancer, first occurrence of cancer, but it may affect tumor biology, make tumors less invasive, less likely to metastasize, and therefore there may be a reduction in cancer death or uh, advanced, such as metastatic cancer. This requires further study, not ready to make general public health recommendations that everyone take vitamin D for this purpose, but there's some exciting research in that area. Another finding we had for vitamin D was a significant reduction in autoimmune diseases, such as rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis. And this may be because vitamin D has been shown to have some benefits for the immune system to boost uh, immune function, and, but to tamp down inflammation. Both of these would be relevant to reducing risk of autoimmune diseases, as well as potentially to reducing severity of COVID illness, which is why I said during the pandemic, it would be reasonable to take 1,000 to 2,000 IUs a day of vitamin D, although not essential. Can I ask a, a question, Joanne? Because I think if our listeners were listening to this, you're, you're listing all of these things when you take vitamin D that are like statistically significant reduction in cancer. And I think they're all going to be like, oh, I'm, I'm going to go out and do that tomorrow for certain, for every day for the rest of my life. Like that sounds incredibly important. But actually we're sounding quite cautious about your advice on vitamin D. Can you help everybody listening to understand that? I realize that it may not come across clearly whether or not to uh, to take these supplements. I think the main point after all these years of testing vitamin D and seeing these results, we recently published that vitamin D did not prevent fractures, bone fractures and osteoporotic fractures. Um, and that was very surprising to people. And that's because there've been a lot of people have historically thought that it was really important um, against fractures and something that after menopause you should therefore take. Is that right, Joanne? It was believed that if vitamin D had any role, it was for bone health and preventing fractures, preventing osteoporosis. Now, the findings don't mean that vitamin D has no role in maintaining bone health. What it means is that we need only small to moderate amounts of vitamin D for bone health, for cardiovascular disease, and for many of these other health outcomes. The reason is probably that evolutionarily, because vitamin D is so essential to health, we evolved to be able to regulate the metabolism of vitamin D very tightly so that in terms of the biologically active form of vitamin D, enough is getting into the tissues, is getting to the vitamin D receptor. We don't need large amounts. The amount we can get from food sources and from incidental sun exposure. You know, as I mentioned, we synthesize um, vitamin D, a precursor of vitamin D in the skin from ultraviolet B light exposure. So just being outdoors 15 minutes, a few times a week, you know, doing um, running errands, and being taking walks, being physically active will provide you know, some incidental sun exposure, um, not during winter months, but you know, during, uh, during let's say, six um, months of the year, and some of that vitamin D is then stored. And there are food sources of vitamin D. Joanne, can I jump for a minute from vitamin D over to omega-3? Because I know you looked at that in the same study, and this is something that I've been interested in in my own research. And we know as nutritional scientists that all, you know, all omega-3 is not the same, that there's different types of omega-3 fats. And I think this is somewhere, again, where it'd be really good to be able to inform people on what to look at on the back of the pack of their supplements in relation to omega-3, because there's the kind of omega-3 that we know, which we call EPA and DHA. Jonathan, I know you don't like me to do long names, so I'm not going to give you the long name, um, um, which actually comes from fish oil. And then there's the more plant-based. It's not quite as uh, big uh, an omega-3 
um, fat that um, I won't again give you the fatty acid name, but um, it'd be really good, Joanne, if you could point um, listeners in the direction of what to look for and what you think based on your research and what we know in nutritional research has a greater efficacy in health outcomes. I think that's a really good point. We really should separate and and make clear whether we're talking about the marine fish oil-based omega-3s, which are EPA plus DHA. We tested the marine omega-3s in a dose of 1.2 to 1 of the EPA to DHA. So it was a combination, a little more EPA than DHA in the vital trial. There's also plant-based such as alpha-linolenic acid and some of the plant-based omega-3s and 3 fatty acids do get converted to EPA, DHA, EPA. So, you know, you do get some of those uh, marine-based omega-3s from the plant conversion of plant-based, but it's at a, a relatively low level. Um, There have been some trials of plant-based omega-3s, been inconsistent in terms of the clear benefits. Overall, for the marine fish-based omega-3s, and there's work on an algae-based form of this, which may be more environmentally sustainable long-term. But anyway, for the EPA DHA, Um, The evidence overall is that there's a small reduction in heart disease, but no clear reduction in stroke or in the major cardiovascular events. When you're looking at heart disease and stroke, it may be only a modest, if any, reduction because stroke is generally not reduced. Yeah. In in summary, Joanne, when people ask me, should I have the fish oil-based omega-3, or can I have any old omega-3? I always suggest to people that they should have the fish oil omega-3. Would you agree with that? I I would agree that there's much more evidence for the fish-based omega-3s in terms of reduction in cardiovascular outcomes, especially heart disease and heart attack. Listening to that, it didn't sound like you were pushing very hard that I should be taking omega-3 every day. This sounded like these were quite small impacts, which after all, we know that if you just taught me to improve the quality of my diet, I would also probably have a very big impact on all of these things. So just it it sounded like you were much softer than on vitamin D. Is that a misunderstanding? Well, I, I think that we're not quite ready to make public health recommendations that everyone take a fish oil supplement. What we found in Vital was that in people who had low fish consumption in their diet, low dietary intake of fish at baseline, fish being the major, the primary source of the marine omega-3s, they benefited more from the one gram a day we tested. In fact, that group did have a reduction in the primary endpoint of major cardiovascular events, close to a 20% reduction. And those who were already getting one and a half servings per week of fish did not benefit. So if you have very low fish consumption, if you're a vegetarian or you don't like fish, you know you may want to talk with your healthcare provider about whether you should take a uh, fish oil supplement or even a prescription omega-3 because that's where the benefit was. We also surprisingly...